earth. My child, inside you are two wolves. One is cosmopolitan globalism. It seeks to create a centralized, homogenous, and bureaucratic system of control on a global scale. The other is isolationist nationalism. It seeks to create a centralized, homogenous, and bureaucratic system of control on a local scale. Who wins? Neither. They both lose to new medievalism because that's what happens when the two inevitably make a baby. I'm gonna get medieval on your ass. You go. Hey guys, welcome to the channel. If you're new here, I pity you because this is where we make exciting things like edgy cyberpunk anime everyone liked into a dark vision of the future. Unless you like that sort of thing. And to my regular viewers, great to see you chaps again. You guys might not have noticed, but since I made my last video, I'm a changed man. Changed by my quest into the obscurities of the old world. I'm in Europe now. I left my cozy home in South America in order to freeze to death in Finland. How in God's name did I end up in Skyrim? Oh wait, I mean Santa's workshop, because Finland doesn't exist. It's a lie, set up by the Pentagon to stick it to China. But I'm not settled here. Since I left Brazil a few weeks ago, I've been through Portugal, Amsterdam, and especially Poland. Not only the country of origin of the guys who made the relevant video game everyone suddenly liked, now, after the Japanese did a thing, I swear anime is magic, but also a country which granted me personal insights in my stay there as I did a gun course in the European Security Academy which is based there. Yeah, that was the first time I ever held a gun by the way. Those are live ammo rounds. Look at me getting all dangerous. I didn't know anything about this, but thank god truly for the great instructors there. Kept everyone safe, everything was done correctly. Anyway, in case you guys haven't realized yet, this is actually a sneaky update video disguised as a video essay to let you guys know I'm traveling around the world and what I'm up to. So you guys understand why I'm not very interactive anymore in the comments and why I won't be for a while. But nobody watches channel update videos so I decided to use my travels as a way to reflect, inspire, and illustrate a shorter and more concise video on a topic that I've been asked about before. And as usual, the topic ran away from me and I started writing the script for several days and then this video is I don't know how long. But anyway, let's talk cyberpunk edgerunners. As I travel through Europe, especially now in our time, I can see the geopolitical forces I often reflect and read about, but up close. Very up close. Too close. I can also see the historical legacies that brought us to this point, and I think I can see the cycle. Europe is the epicenter of nationalist and globalist forces fighting for the destiny of civilization. And the most hilarious thing about it is that both of them think they're both losing to the other side. But they're both right because they both are losing. We're seeing something else happening to civilization in the 21st century. And I'm seriously hard pressed to find a better representation of what is happening and the type of world we're moving into than the cyberpunk franchise. Especially the background lore of it all. That's right, in case you haven't noticed, we're living in a cyberpunk dystopia right now. Crazy billionaires are experimenting with cyborg tech or virtual reality to trap us into a reality that they have full control over. Asian corporations and influence are becoming hegemonic in the global economy and culture. There's a global market for organs and even the body parts of little babies. Identity is commodified in an ultra-consumer society and mad scientists are promising to alter how people were born and creating confusions of identity with surgeries trying to blur the lines of natural human biology. We're seeing the beginning of euthanization of the weak and poor so as to relieve the costs of an overbearing government. Communism and capitalism merge in a very weird dystopian way, making communist governments essentially function as a giant national corporation. Soon, simple commercial ships have to be fitted with machine gun turrets to defend themselves from pirate drones. Prosthetic limbs are finally going to be widespread. Corporations are now vastly more powerful than most of the world's governments. Societies the world over are breaking down in violent protests, and private security is outcompeting the public police forces and militaries. But it's the sociopolitical aspect of the cyberpunk genre which interests me more than the techno-scientific wizardry of it all. Because this is actually the real core of what the cyberpunk genre is since weird techno stuff is present in all sci-fi scenarios. 
and it's the socio-economic and even geopolitical take of this gritty genre that makes it the most accurate to where we're headed as a society. At this rate, cyberpunk won't be classified as science fiction anymore, but more just social commentary on contemporary culture. Heck, it already is! But Pilgrim, how can we protect ourselves in a cyberpunk dystopia where data is power? Well bro, embrace your cyberpunk reality by buying into the corporate system. Become a client, not a commodity, with the help of this episode's sponsor, Atlas VPN. Atlas VPN protects your Google search data from being tracked leading to organic search results instead of what others want you to find. It stops ads and malware in your journey through the internet. If those cyber child soldiers in the anime had Atlas VPN, they'd have survived. And not all of us have a sexy edge runner girlfriend to protect our data like David Martinez. With Atlas VPN, it actually notifies you when someone is trying to steal your data. But seriously though, I can only talk to people I love who are currently inside dictatorships because of virtual private networks. And there's no better deal in the market than Atlas VPN, and you can unlock content from all over the world. Embrace the imminent neo-medievalism by using Atlas VPN to protect unlimited devices with a single subscription. Get it for just $1.70 a month, plus six months extra. Limited time offer. If you're interested, you guys can check the link down in the description. Fun fact, this video was not going to be about Cyberpunk 2077 specifically but a mixture of different franchises forcefully meshed together as an excuse to talk about an obscure political theory concept coined in the 1970s. Because I have a political theory master's degree and by heaven I will use it for something! But as I started to look into examples of new medievalism in fiction, to my surprise, this genre and specifically Cyberpunk 2077 was an absolutely great fit which got me watching all the episodes of Edge Runners in preparation for this video. Now I've never played the game, and by no means am I a lore expert, and the anime is actually very shallow in its depiction of the socio-political reality of the setting. But after all my research, by which I mean goofing off the internet and asking my gamer friends, it's obvious how cyberpunk is a great foundation to explain new medievalism and thus the probable future of civilization in the next couple of decades according to many political theorists. And this is an important discussion for us to have considering most of us might live to see it come to fruition if we don't get nuked and have the Mad Max scenario instead. Heck, that might happen and we might still get new medievalism. That's, that's how new medievalism works. That's how crazy it is. Now, what is new medievalism? Let's start by saying what it is not, because it is not neo-feudalism. The latter is a specific political and economic structure adopted by a society. It's included in neo-medievalism, but neo-medievalism is way bigger than just having a stratified class system of nobles and peasants. A neo-medieval world would be like the world in the medieval ages, or even the world in cyberpunk, because it will be a world full of empires, powerful merchant city-states, random gangs and militias everywhere, massive corporations that control land in several continents with their own sovereignty, rich families with power equivalent to small nations, countries that have to compete with these corporate powers in their own territory and even roaming bands of nomadic barbarians for good measure. Point is, it has to do with an immensely diverse world order where the centrally organized nation-state system of the modern era or the massive global regulation institutions of the current day failed and we have something more akin to European Christendom from a thousand years ago. And this is what I'm seeing up close in Europe. In Portugal, I visited the headquarters of an old international military and religious banking conglomerate that spanned three continents, a Templar monastery. But when the French started an international purge of the Templars with papal backing, this launched a chain reaction that turned the Templars into agents of the Portuguese state, as the newly named Order of Christ. They were basically nationalized by Portugal, so as to be saved in an emerging new world of centralized and sovereign nations, with little room for foreign armed religious international banks. But now we see the opposite happening again in Europe, a return of the powerful international banks and international warrior organizations, though there is still just a shadow of what they're destined to become. In my brief period in Yusuka during that gun course, I was taught by instructors from many nations, and I learned 
alongside people from all over the world. Yuzuka has campuses in several continents, and they trade national military forces from everywhere, as well as bodyguards who are then handpicked by NATO guys for the protection of diplomats. But they also train random international civilians like me if we pay for the courses. Most people have no clue just how significant this is and what the world is about to become, which is why I took the course. In addition to learning how to defend myself in case we go Mad Max, I'm writing a political theory book on the subject, and my master's degree dissertation was roughly about this as well, which is one of the main reasons I wanted to get a closer look at it so I could be more informed in how the whole thing works, which is why the trained observer can tell I've never done this before. That right there is the style of a prissy academic. Anyway, the nation state system we know of today, when we look at world maps with national governments, national banks, national armies developed in Europe, is now dissolving in the very continent that gave birth to it. But a homogenized, globalized world order is also not what will replace it. If a neo-medievalist world order, full of powerful corporations, sects, gangs, religions, and what's left of nations, all fighting each other is a cyberpunk dystopia, then globalism of the World Economic Forum is a brave new world. Globalization has been the assumed next step of the 21st century by most analysts and economists until very recently, usually as a result of either neoliberal market-obsessed motivations where businesses dissolve national barriers for that sweet, sweet global green cheddar, or as a result of international cooperation between governments and a shrinking world making nation-states voluntarily give up their sovereignty for security in a worldwide system of international law which would need to be imposed by a supranational institution like the UN. Whichever the case, the ideological attitude seeing this as a good thing for human civilization has been generally called globalism. You know, all that outsourcing and offshoring of companies and one massive supply chain system that integrates all nations into one global economy? It used to be that the main effect of globalization is one homogenous world culture, where we all wear blue jeans and talk about the Kardashians. I was a happier man before I ever heard of them. Maybe I should owe nothing to regain that spring in my step, eh? Point is, now we see there are groups with interest in creating one single bureaucratic power base with the power to regulate the world, either to deal with the climate change, pandemics, or just to stop wars. Are you on the US and the Chinese side? Because now, progressively, a lot of people would like to see there, there are two orders in this world. This is a huge mistake, even for both the US and China. We need single global order. But this, of course, has its prominent critics. By presumptuous, power-mad, globalist utopians. And for good reason. The whole globalist moniker is associated with right-wing conspiracy theories, but it's actually a serious idea discussed by powerful men and academics for centuries, especially after World War II. The hearing was titled, To Seek Development of the United Nations into a World Federation. The tendency to form one world bureaucracy, other than terrifying, will also stifle human development and probably even expansion into space which is a big theme in Cyberpunk Edgerunners, the anime, where the intense competition on Earth incentivizes people to leave it to find peace in the stars, which is Lucy's ultimate life goal in the anime. We see this historically, where the intense competition on the European continent, still very medieval in many ways, is what caused millions like the English pilgrims to move to America. You know who didn't expand? China, with its stifling centralized bureaucracy who regulated everything and closed the ports, even though they had more advanced ships a century before Columbus, which is the core message of what funny Texas me man keeps harping on about. Yeah, I had to mention him, despite how outlandish he is all the time, since he popularized the sentiment against globalist ideologues before it became mainstream. Point is, despite all his ridiculous nonsense, where he says crap like this, I I'll admit it. I will eat my neighbors. I'm not letting my kids die. I I'm just gonna be honest. Such insanity aside, 
He actually deserves points for bringing some of this stuff out for open discussion. I'm critical of Alex Jones on a lot, but his core message is that political and technological and economic power is getting too centralized on Earth, and this trend is being pushed by power-hungry elites, and it gets in the way of space colonization because expanding too much into space, so it threatens centralized power. Which sounds insane the way he says it, but here are some more rational-sounding gentlemen talking about this very issue. They have to decide, do we want to expand or not? And connected to that, do we want to give a lot of power to a central elite? Right. Or do we want to uh, distribute the, the, the power centers, which is naturally connected to the expansion? When you expand, you well, distribute the power. The reason for this stagnation of humanity would also be due to the homogenization of the world into one cosmopolitan urban culture where everyone talks the same, dresses the same, and behaves the same, making globalists in fact intense imperialists who can't accept other cultures, which is exactly what we're seeing with all the attacks on Qatar now. It's probably not because of bad working conditions in Qatar, because globalists are on record praising the Chinese model. I. Uh, respect uh, China's achievements, which are tremendous over the last uh, over 40 years since the opening up and uh, policy and reform policy came into action. I think it's um, a role model for many countries, but I think also uh, we should leave it to each country uh, to make its own decision what system it wants to adapt. And I think we should be very careful in imposing systems. But the Chinese model is certainly a very attractive model for quite a number of countries. Which is ironic that old Klaus talks about not imposing systems on countries when in the same interview he says this. But um, we have to go one step further. We have to have a strategic mood. We have to construct the world of tomorrow. It's a systemic transformation of the world. So we have to define how the world should look like, which we want to come out of this transformation period. That's why Qatar is a problem, because it's an Islamic monarchy with their own style of dress, their own beliefs, their own way of doing things. So they have to be reshaped. I'm not praising Qatar. I'm just saying I don't believe for a second that the international media gives a crap about human rights. But in any case, globalism has failed, as supply chains are breaking down and nations are now fighting each other to the death and threatening nuclear war. As dystopian as the anarchic fierce competition of cyberpunk might seem, with all the mega corporations, gangs, and nations all fighting each other in a vicious dog-eat-dog -dog world, we can't forget that the original sci-fi dystopias from Orwell's 1984 and Aldous Huxley's Brave New World were warning us about the dangers of too much centralized power. This fear of a centralized power structure that swallows up the world is precisely why people's reflex is to immediately revert to nationalist sentiments. I'm doubtful though. I actually think nation states are the inevitable first step to a global order because they are based on the same argument of security where you give up rights to a central sovereign so they can impose laws to prevent conflict. Also, you divide the world into a bunch of centrally controlled neat little sovereign pieces. The ability to organize the world under one central body like a supervision of the UN becomes easier. Also, nations try to homogenize the different cultures in their own borders to increase control which leads to tensions. Nationalism is just globalism at a smaller scale, if you think about it. This would be impossible in the neo-medieval world of cyberpunk with all these city-states, private armies, regional empires, roaming bands of warrior nomads, and heaven knows what else, which is why we see national leaders like Macron and others call for the creation of a new single global order. Even nationalist leaders like in Poland or Hungary cling to the European Union, seeing an advantage to the economic integration. This means that nationalism won't save you, because powerful people in your own nation state are against you, as well as more than half of your own fellow citizens in most circumstances, which leads to the inevitable result of nationalists forming an international coalition of fellow nationalists, like when the CPAC met in Hungary. 
barátokra kell lenni, és szövetségesekkel találni egymásban, koordinálunk kell csapataink mozgását, mert nagy megméretetés előtt állunk. 2024. Or George Maloney uses the Lord of the Rings as a national mythos for Italy. Or those in Spain start imitating the branding from Donald Trump. You even see famous nationalists who end up having international marriages. Heck, Donald Trump is one of those. It's a paradoxical globalized nationalism. This is not the true nationalism of the early 20th century, which was a global phenomenon, sure, but the national movements within each country were very distinct from one another, especially in social doctrine and beliefs based on the native conditions of each country. Brazilian nationalism was pro-miscegenation. The Germans were against it, for instance. Even if certain nationalist groups aided each other, like the Germans in Spain during the Civil War, they weren't a single international movement, which is why Franco gave a big F.U. to the Austrian painter after being helped. What we're seeing now is a weird anti-globalist global movement where everybody basically talks the same, from political slogans to even the same memes. And nationalists themselves are starting to realize this, as I've recently been seeing memes like this everywhere. Even ethno-nationalists and ethno-supremacists are suddenly discovering themselves in oddly diverse social media groups of like-minded people from diverse nations and ethnicities. So. You, by your own assessment, are a racist. What are you doing here breaking, breaking bread with, uh, with black people? Because he's a racist as well. The black man is a worse racist than I am. I've even seen some joke that they're more diverse than a wealthy socially liberal neighborhood, which is true, hilariously so. And this is what really killed the alt-right. I knew this would happen back in the day. Because racerism is very silly. A movement that limits itself by race or nationality will be outcompeted by groups who can recruit talented members from wherever and they'll be forced to do the same. Which is why I don't take racerism as a serious social issue and I think the people who obsess about it are misguided or politically Machiavellian and using it for whatever. Not intellectually honest I mean. Because the incentives in the world we live in is to not be like that and we're seeing it be dissolved in real time. And when it comes to the notion of a nation state, it has always been fragile since its conception in 1618 in Westphalia. Many nations don't have a common language, are very ethnically diverse, and have separatist movements seeking self-determination or a full-on colony. National sovereignty, in my opinion, has always kind of been an arbitrary and a lie. There's no sovereignty, only spheres of influence and subjugation to larger players. And a lot of the national lines seem arbitrary in themselves. In a new medieval world order, this just becomes honestly admitted. Globalism is also failing hard though. It's why Macron was whining in APEC and why we see people getting very nervous that the global order is fracturing into spheres of influence. Just two right now, the USA and China, but more will emerge from the vacuum of power left by a broken global order. The fact that Joe Biden is forced to restore American manufacturing back to the United States and bring back factory jobs is a huge shift away from globalism. Let me start off with two words. Made in America. Made in America. But this isn't nationalism, however, because a lot of those new manufacturing jobs in the USA are paid for by corporations like Samsung a massive Korean conglomerate which basically controls the Korean economy and is now getting its hooks in American communities. Samsung Austin Semiconductor is one of the world's most advanced semiconductor manufacturing facilities with more than 3,000 employees who provides a great place to work as well as advanced and upskilled training to thriving employees. By the way, Samsung is a massive corporate empire owned by a single family complete with old patriarchs who die and leave control of the company in chaos. Or ambitious younger patriarchs rising to take control of the family business. And now this powerful Asian family is gaining control of a town in Texas. This is neo medievalism. It's the end of the modern era. American peasants will be working for foreign lords who speak foreign languages and are of a different culture which coincides with the shrinking of the American and global middle class, which means more of this will happen. The American people will get poorer and gratefully work for rich billionaires from all over the world, though mostly Asia, as we see Indians also rising to prominence over there. 
international networks will increase and become more convoluted, but competition between these international networks will also increase and break down the international order. In short, globalization and localization are happening at the same time. And this is what people are now calling glocalization. Yeah, I know geopolitics can get weird, but it's going to get a whole lot weirder. Globalism is popular among the university elites and the upper middle class types, while nationalism is more popular among the working class or middle class. But ironically, the tensions between these forces will create a hyper competitive world where all the different interests will align in strange ways, like turning Texas into the China of South Korean companies, apparently. Fact is, several key factors make the neo medievalism we see in cyberpunk inevitable. We have a universal lingua franca, or common language, in English, which allows for international groups to form based on individuals of various backgrounds who can form cooperative alliances based on common interests, like the Edrina crews and corporations in cyberpunk, and the knightly orders and mercenary companies in the middle ages. We also have a demographic crisis, a population collapse worldwide, and not enough young people, which means nations are desperate and inviting foreigners, either as lower class workers or as foreign overlords with the expertise to improve the local community, similar to the Arasaka Corporation being invited into Night City in the cyberpunk lore, or the Rus family being invited to become royalty in Slavic lands. You have also multiculturalism of an imperial age, where prosperous times allow for many different cultures to coexist in relative cooperation, but then they suddenly descend into intense competition and rivalry once resources get scarce and the imperial peace collapses. Like in the end of the Roman Empire, having all those different groups fighting each other, the Saxons and the Bretons, etc. And the different gangs in Night City forming around competing cultural identities. Like you have the Cowboys and the Valentinos, etc. We also see the rise of different religions that offer comfort and services that the government no longer can, as well as rising piracy and mercenaries. All things we see in the early Middle Ages, in cyberpunk, and right now in the real world. Piracy and nations attacking each other's ships are increasing because the American military and navy doesn't have enough personnel or ships to patrol the Earth's oceans as rivals produce cheap but effective drones in Iran, or the largest navy in the world is in China. And yeah, the American military is still the best, but that's not enough to be an uncontested superpower able to impose a global order. If regional powers can contest your power in their home regions, that's enough to demote you into just another great power, even if you're still the greatest. And aircraft carriers are designed to project power against rival nations, not patrol the oceans from piracy, or random nations starting to get fussy with each other's cargo ships. Also, America has a massive recruitment crisis for their military due to obesity and the aforementioned demographic collapse, which means that more contractors and private military companies will be hired from all over the world. And the rise of these companies are the single greatest threat to both globalism and nationalism. They're a threat to globalism because as private armies become normalized, anyone with money can harness the power of a small state, which increases the ability of random factions to appear and compete with violence. Sean McFate, in his book, mentions how a Hollywood actress hired a PMC to protect an African ethnic group from genocide. And these private interests are a threat to the state, who loses the monopoly on violence in their own borders and loses their prime soldiers who go on to fight or train someone else, sometimes even enemies of the state. And the ability for a nation state or a global order to regulate these private armies and individuals is diminishing by the year because the private market for force is impossible to regulate because they can kill the regulators. You can only regulate with overwhelming force and countries can't regulate them because they need them. Which means that all we're doing is waiting for the market of private militaries to reach a critical mass. And once that happens, that's it. It's over for the nation state and the global order. And we will officially be in a cyberpunk and neo-medieval world order or world disorder. There will be too many private groups with weapons to keep track. So as a result, we'll have massively powerful corporations, roaming pirate gangs, religious groups, and as a result, maybe even crazy new tech not regulated by a central power. And I'm not accusing any specific company, and especially not the ones who mostly just train people in useful and necessary skills like Yusika. I can't wait to do the medical courses with them and learn how to save lives. Such companies are fantastic and they're great and needed. 
I'm just agreeing with Sean McFade's assessment and how this massively growing industry gives birth to too many companies that can't be regulated. But this issue is caused by power-hungry bureaucrats in charge of national militaries anyway, so you, so you can't really blame the companies for that. They're answering to a demand. It's the ones in charge of the nations themselves who never really thought any of this through, and now this is where we are. Also, there's this. So is now the opinion uh, globalization has failed and we are entering into an era of deglobalization. I think that's wrong. In reality, uh, the world has moved closer together because um, uh, we, we are moving from a physical world much more in a digital world. And by the way, old Uncle Klaus is wrong because the internet is polarizing people into different tribes and identities. But he's right that it's dismantling borders. The internet is crucial for the new era we're entering, which really brings in the cyber and the cyberpunk. Fast communication and travel will make groups and influence flow between borders and intensify overlapping power structures and multiple loyalties. I'm a good example of this. I have two passports and I'm a Catholic, so I am loyal and have responsibilities to both Brazil, Italy, and the Pope. I'm all over the place and belong to several groups and I love them all. I cannot choose between any of these. I am these. You see, the reality about political power is that throughout history, there have been four main archetypes of power. Classes, you might say. Like in an RPG video game. But instead of archer, knight, mage, and thief, we have the merchant, the priest, the warrior, and the bureaucrat. I didn't take these archetypes from nowhere. They're derived from real historical class systems from India, Japan, medieval Europe, China, and others. These are basically universal archetypes of power, and the various political systems we see are usually a variation of when one of these classes is the ruling class. Like how the merchants ruled the city-state of Venice, the priests ruled in India, the warriors in Japan, and the bureaucrats in China. Many people don't realize this, but a lot of history is a struggle between these guys. It's not that simple, of course, but if we're oversimplifying things, then I'd say that the neo-medievalism of cyberpunk is what happens when the merchant, the warrior, and the priest join forces to just beat the crap out of the bureaucrat, just really wiping the floor with that guy, to the point that he won't be able to stand again for the next several centuries. In Night City, we clearly see that the main power are the corporations. Ergo, Night City is a mercantile city-state run by a financial elite, like Florence with the Medici. But this is just Night City. The different polities in cyberpunk lore are more varied, as you'd expect from your medievalism. Like how Europe is basically the EU, as far as I can tell, but you know, with balls and a backbone. But with globalization and the nation-state destroyed, what you have is a series of different societies with different political structures, some where the warriors rule, like the gangs and the nomads, some where the priests rule, like in Poland, according to the cyberpunk lore, and of course, the merchants, creating an intense political diversity that produces an insane amount of different cultures, even in the same physical space. In our world, it's not like that yet, exactly, because of the bureaucrats who hold the monopoly on power worldwide, be it within nation states, like in China and everywhere else, or in a global bureaucratic system, like the UN. And the merchant is just behind the bureaucrat in power, with these mega CEO corporate overlords. And the bureaucrat, as an archetype of political power, is something not well understood or even noticed that much across the political spectrum. Memes like this are funny and simplistic, but it's also a little accurate on the stereotypes of how different sides blame one group for everything. But if there was one group that I'd actually put the blame on for our current world problems, it'd be the bureaucrats as a class, which is one of the reasons people have a hard time understanding my political position a lot of the times, since they don't fall into one of these stereotypes. But why the bureaucrats? Well, why not? It doesn't surprise me why they are the most powerful players in the world, and they shape the modern era as we know it, but there's no real organized political or ideological resistance against them as a class. While there is organized resistance and ideological hostility against other classes and groups, and that's exactly what you expect by the class that is really in control. Okay, so let's define these different archetypes of power so that we can then understand the bureaucrat. The warrior, right? These are the soldiers, military officers, police, etc. 
The warrior is defined by combat and sacrifice, because death is a huge part of their identity. The merchant, these are the businessmen, the CEOs, industrialists, etc. Defined by profit and dealing, which often makes them the most hated of the bunch, and I used to hate them as well, as a class, until I realized that when in the service for good, the merchant can create win-win situations that benefit all sides. The priest, these are the clerics, the shamans, the pastors, the imams, the swamis, and well, the priests. They are defined by duty to the divine, ritual, asceticism, and a search for something more. And the bureaucrat? He's the official, you know, the despero, in a government or a corporation. The fabric of management and administration. In other words, control. The bureaucrat is defined by control more than any of the other archetypes. You know, the regulations, the procedures, the processing, the papers, the licenses. The bureaucrat is not an evil parasite that must be purged in a glorious revolution, like how the Marxists see the bourgeois. However, as a class, it is dead weight, when conditions align historically to make them so. The bureaucrat first emerged in China 300 years before Christ, precisely as a means to strengthen centralized control of the imperial government. And the modern bureaucrat appeared in France in the 18th century. That's where we get the name, you know, Bureau, je suis français. And why I keep taking pot shots at the French, by the way. I love France, but I'm critical of the modern world that France created, although I really like French history. The bureaucrat's tendency, like I said, is inherently one of increasing control, while the other archetypes are not defined by control to the same extent, even if they're essential to it. And the bureaucrat is inherently tied to academia because that's where they receive training to become bureaucrats. It also explains why higher education is getting so expensive now. It's a way to limit entrance into the top positions of the bureaucratic elite. But it's not working, and we're still having too many wannabe elites getting college diplomas, and not enough bureaucrat positions. So they're fighting each other in what's called elite overproduction by scientists like Peter Churchin. In the past, intellectual training was mostly for the warrior aristocracy like knights and the samurai or ascetic celibate priests who worked in hospitals and such, like in the Carolingian Empire. The modern era created a class of indolent academic sophists who don't sacrifice anything and have no connection to the harsh reality of the rest of the population. So all they do is use their trained eloquence to push their bureaucratic class interests and hedonism. That's why universities are a joke now, where people just demand more power over the culture or obsess over sex and push their fetishes. I mean, stuff you wouldn't believe. This is why our culture is so obsessed with sex and policing language these days. Because the ruling class is a useless bureaucracy with too much free time. The reason why governments get bigger and corporations more bloated with useless bullcrap jobs is because the bureaucratic class gets bigger as you need to create more cushy new jobs for the new bureaucrats who are often the sons and daughters of the older ones. But it interests them as a class to always increase regulation or new corporate or government departments that regulate random crap like teenagers who say the n-word online or something. Don't get me wrong, I'm speaking mostly of the entrenched bureaucratic elites, not the poor guy in the DMV who wants to shoot himself. Regulations are important, but the bureaucrats themselves aren't regulated. Heck, it was their policies that destroy the global economy now. But don't worry, they'll be fine with our tax dollars propping them up, except the corporate bureaucrats because they're getting fired by the merchant class bosses, which is infuriating their fellow bureaucrats and governments, so you bet that they'll blame the global recession on business. But that'll be nonsense. The bureaucracy as a whole, whether in government or corporations, is a system of control and the bureaucrats are the ones that don't bleed for anything. They don't build or risk their money and they don't dedicate themselves to anything higher or practice any ascetic virtue. But they still tax and control all of us with the full might of the state. Like for instance, the whole tax the rich line is really just a ploy for bureaucratic control because they control our tax money. We don't control that money. And they spend it on stuff that most of us don't really agree to. The businesses at least made money that we voluntarily gave them because they built something cool that we wanted to buy. And by the way, I'm not a libertarian. Big corporations can be just as bureaucratic as governments. And I don't mind government control if the people in charge earned that control. But the bureaucrats did not earn it. They got hammered and high in college and then got a cushy job laundering our money. And also what bothers me is that bureaucrats as we know them, the modern bureaucrats, they could be replaced by 
The priest class, like in Charlemagne's era, where the clerics were ascetic monks who fasted all the time, or the warrior class, like in the Edo period, where the samurai were bureaucrats, but they shanked themselves with a sword every time they made a typo. Like, that was cool, man. That was cool. Say what you want about those samurais, they were cool. But for us, in our day, we have an overbloated class of coked up douchebags who let Jeffrey Epstein kill himself. Apparently. I know all the power archetypes have their dark side. The merchant can sell others as slaves, the warrior commit massacres, and the priest can get us to do crazy blood orgies and human sacrifice. But they have their noble and necessary side too. While I personally struggle to see the value in the bureaucrat when administration can be done by the other archetypes. That's why I think that the end of modernity and the rise of new medievalism is not necessarily a bad thing. I mean, of course, Night City in the cyberpunk Edge Runners anime is indeed a nightmare, but it's one that, if we see happen in the real world, would be caused by the nature of our failed ruling class, because of a top-heavy system about to fall over. Whether in nation-states, like in China, which is happening right now, with people protesting against those useless medical regulations made precisely by bureaucrats out of touch with the needs of the general population and who are shielded by the effects of their stupid regulations because of tax money. At least the corporate guys will lose if they make stupid decisions that make everybody poorer, but the bureaucrat doesn't suffer that. He's safe in his little bubble and can, and can make people starve to death in their homes for no good reason. And we also see the bureaucrats falling over in a globalized world order, as a lot of their globalization policies have caused very dumb decisions, like giving dictatorships that are untrustworthy access to control over energy and production of necessary goods. Highly centralized, regulated power structures benefit the bureaucrat way more than the merchant or the warrior priest. These are the other archetypes of political power that actually benefit from new medievalism, which is why we're seeing it emerge. The new medieval era we will see will be initially brutal and violent, but new eras always are, before they get stabilized. Even the modern era was very brutal in the beginning, with the whole reign of terror in France and the Napoleonic Wars and such. And right now, it's quite clear that we're seeing something new here, like the rise of private cities springing up all over the world, some purely for private financial reasons, and some are even built for religious purposes. And also the war in Ukraine is full of foreigners fighting for both sides. And we see how important foreign fighters are in all conflicts. The merchant will benefit from businesses that transcend national barriers, but also by not being subjected to a global regulatory body, which can get rid of tax havens, for instance. <laughs> While the warrior benefits from fighting alongside anyone of any background, as long as they have the skill, which is why even in nasal Germany, we could see some surprising amount of diversity in their armed forces. And the priest benefits from an autonomous international church, which can run its own affairs. My point is, the historical circumstances of our era right now is, are producing incentives that make the transition away from globalism and nationalism seem pretty much unstoppable. Because only one archetype of political power, the bureaucrat, benefits from either the nation state or a global order when it comes to power. Although I still have a lot of thinking to do about this, so I could be wrong, but that's just my thoughts on the subject right now. But I could change in the future. I'm still reflecting a lot about this. Anyway, dystopian sci-fi can often be used to make analogies on how human societies could develop. Orwell's 1984 is a good example of a nationalistic surveillance society run by totalitarian bureaucrats who prime people up against a foreign enemy and cultivate a socially conservative culture in order to keep their peasants productive and competitive against their enemies. China, North Korea, etc. Aldous Huxley's Brave New World is a good example of how a globalist society could emphasize hedonism and no sense of cultural roots or greater values in order to keep people docile and easy to control in a global system run by manipulative bureaucrats who are experts in social engineering. I don't know, the EU. <laughs> I'm, I'm partly kidding. And the cyberpunk edge runners is the chaos of unfettered and relentless competition between human groups all sporting an extremely diverse array of motivations, methods, and identities, as opposed to the homogeny present in a nation state or a globalized world order. And we're seeing it caused by the USA now, which is cool, but chop chop Americans, I want the neo medieval order right now so I can live out my dream of being a techno barbarian cyborg baron living off of a fiefdom in Minnesota or some shit. <laughs> However, one possible alternative to all these scenarios could be the Terran Federation system, which in my opinion is a semi-modern, semi-medieval system where 
There is a central regulatory body, which is typical of, of modernity, but it's also highly federalized and localized and is run by a class of warriors, Chad veterans, which is kind of more medieval. And, but these veterans, they earn the moral right to authority through sacrifice and risking their lives to those they rule. It's kind of a mix of noblesse oblige and liberal democracy. In case we do find ourselves entering a chaotic new period in world history, I think the key is for us to form communities and we can use the internet for that. You know, networks of support where we can all help each other out and keep in contact and support one another, which is a pretty wholesome way to use the internet. Also, if you want to understand new medievalism better, I recommend this video right here, made by one of those magical Indian explainers that make everything more simple and easy to understand. A system of overlapping authority and multiple loyalty. Now this last phrase is the key to understanding what the theory of neo-medievalism is. Everybody loves Indian YouTubers for this reason, right? I certainly do. I recommend this video, it's fantastic. It'll, uh, it'll explain things better than I ever could. And by the way, for any of you fellow Catholics who might be listening, let's try and pray the rosary every once in a while for peace on earth and for us to avoid nuclear warfare or anything like that. That's uh, it's something that has been really bothering me lately. I don't know it's be if it's because I was in Poland when the missiles hit or, or anything like that, but um, yeah, let's, let's keep world peace in our prayers. Well, that's it for me then. Thank you all who have been watching this far and a big thanks and shout out to my patrons. I only hope that I'm not letting you guys down in the content I make, and I'll keep working to be worthy of your support. Thank you all for listening to my ramblings. Have a good day, my friends.